What's up everyone? Today we are talking about one of the biggest pitfalls that I see in developing improvisers as they're trying to get their music theory chops together. Just because we as musicians understand a concept, we also tend to think that means we can execute it on our horns. Today, we're gonna to talk about how to close that gap between understanding and execution, specifically how it applies to one of the most fundamental music theory items that we need to know to be better improvisers. That is how to apply arpeggios. Now, practicing arpeggios is certainly not the most flashy aspect of becoming a good improviser. However, the way you work on this really fundamental thing is gonna affect and impact a lot of the other things you're trying to do as an improviser because arpeggios are so fundamental. So we all practice our arpeggios like this. Now, there is nothing wrong with practicing your arpeggios that way, and that's probably where you need to start. However, if you wanna get the most mileage out of the time invested in these exercises, you might wanna think about changing it up a little bit. So rather than going up and down, I would practice the two directions independently from each other, specifically making sure you descend through the chord without ascending first. I find that all of my students, young and old, beginners, advanced students, all have a harder time descending through the chord when they haven't gone up first. So much easier for us to think about ascending through the chord and stacking up those thirds going up and if we do that first, we give ourselves a pretty big leg up to then go back down through the chord right away. But to be able to actually apply these in music, you gotta be able to do them both directions. So you would start out by just moving this through a straightforward exercise of playing all the arpeggios in whatever tune you're working on, descending. From there, you maybe wanna try the inversions. So start by ascending through each chord. Then to improve that fluency, you gotta go descending in all the inversions. Gaining an understanding of these exercises is not so, so difficult. However, to be able to execute them on your horn at a decent tempo with good accuracy, with a great sound on whatever tune you are working on really does take some practice. So don't bail on these exercises too soon just because you're like, yeah, I got that under control where you can maybe do it 75% of the time. That's not gonna help you when you go to play. If you wanna close that gap between your understanding and your execution, you've gotta be able to do it 90% of the time, 95% of the time with a great sound, with a high level of accuracy and a great time feel. Once you've gained a really developed understanding of moving up and down the arpeggios all across your horn, starting on different chord tones, all that kind of stuff, you then want to think about how you actually might apply these musically. Very rarely do we just like run up one chord, down the next, or any of that kind of stuff. That's just not going to create very satisfying melodies if we do it just like an exercise. So instead, to start instilling that you don't actually have to play the entire chord to use it as a melodic device, you want to set up some sort of artificial limits on how much of the chord you use. Maybe just the root and the third, or the root and the fifth, or maybe the fifth, the flat seven, and the root, and move those little chunks through the chord changes in musical ways. This can help you get in touch with the fact that very often to play the changes and outline the harmony, you don't really need the entire arpeggio. You just need certain key notes from that arpeggio to really indicate that I am inside the changes with the melody that I am trying to create. Once we've laid a lot of groundwork with these foundational type exercises, so we have a lot of fluency going up and down, we can start to think a little bit more about how these chords really connect to each other and about the voice leading between them and maybe set up some exercises to work on this. So if we take the first four bars of our F booze that we've been working on, what if we just play up the first arpeggio? Up our F7 chord, up to our flat seven. We wanna think when I move to that next chord, the B flat chord, what are my closest note options? I could continue to go up to a high F, I could go down to a D, and then you make the choice, which direction do I want my line to go? Do I want the next arpeggio to ascend, or do I want it to descend? If you have done enough practice on those basic exercises, 
you won't really have to think, okay, I'm going from a root position chord and then I'm going to a first inversion chord going up. You can just have easy access to knowing where the chord tones are across your range the entire time so you can move much more freely and think about the melodic shapes and where the line is going rather than just thinking that you're sort of plugging in different arpeggio shapes that are so stuck to the rules. That's not necessarily gonna get you where you wanna go. So from the rest of this, you just continue to look for smooth voice leading. I ended on a B flat in the second measure, so I'm gonna think I could go up for a C in the next chord for the F7 chord, or I could go down to an A. I'm gonna go down to an A, the range is getting a little high, so I'm going to descend. Now when I get to the next measure, the last measure of this phrase, it's two bars of F7 in a row. So you can move however you want through those arpeggios. I'm gonna to choose to just go from the A downward, that ends on a C. So I'm just gonna then move up to the E flat and move downward from there because it's relatively close. You could use a common tone, you could go two Cs in a row, you could go completely somewhere else when you have those same chords in a row. But it's all about looking for smooth voice leading and then being able to apply all of that practice that we've already done. Only practicing arpeggios up and down in the same way every time, even if you do it diligently through the song form, is not going to get you where you want to be in terms of being able to execute these in a musical fashion, particularly if you want to move this to the next step where you just start to use this musically and you start to break up the rhythm a little bit. You start to not worry so much if I'm playing the complete chord, as you know, you do not need to in order to outline the harmony. So that is really where you have to have just a ton of fluency to move these in any direction and be able to hear where the lines are going, not just be able to think about them from a music theory standpoint. <laughs> This gap between theory knowledge and execute on the horn is something that all improvising musicians have to deal with. You work on it through exercises like this. You work on it through listening and transcriptioning and looking for how the masters maybe applied some of that theoretical information. Sometimes it's very clear, sometimes it's less clear about sort of what they were thinking when they were improvising. And then eventually you get to a point where you actually just forget all of this stuff and you just play the ideas that are in your head. But that comes with a lot of repetitive practice on these foundational items. Cool, we'll see you in the woodshed.